In this lesson, we're going to explore the benefits of cloud computing around things like high availability, scalability, elasticity, agility, and disaster recovery. If we look at the skills assessed as part of the curriculum, what we're going to cover here is this identify the benefits and considerations of using cloud services, and then specifically this first skill. So that's the goal of this lesson. Now, when we think about cloud computing, we can start off just thinking about, well, what is the cloud? And there's a joke. There's no such thing as the cloud. It's just someone else's PC. And there's actually quite a bit of truth to that. If we think about capacity, capacity enables us to run services. There's some management interaction, there's some user interface, some user experience. If I think about on-premises, well, on-premises, I have a certain location, and that location has a certain amount of capacity. Now, that capacity could be in the terms of servers with CPU cores and certain amounts of memory. It has certain amounts of storage area networks, maybe your NAS devices, network attached storage, which has a certain capacity to store data, and also has different performance characteristics. We have different amounts of networking and connectivity. But it's basically giving us an amount of capacity in a certain data center. And I might have capacity in different data centers for resiliency, for disaster recovery, to be near my customers so they have a good performance. Then on top of that capacity, we offer certain services. Now, typically on premises, those services are really built on top of virtual machines. Maybe we have containers. And then on top of that, we install our various applications. That could be a custom application we write, that could be a database offering, but we build on top of those layers. There's a management set of instrumentation we use to configure and operate that. And then potentially, depending on how we're offering things to our business units, well, maybe there's also a kind of user experience that our business users can go through, maybe even self-service. So that's capacity on premises. If we think therefore about the cloud, well, it's really nothing different from that. The cloud is fundamentally capacity. So once again, there's this huge amount of capacity available in our cloud service. Now, once again, just like on-premises, that capacity is housed in data centers. There's no real magic. There are building blocks in the cloud. There are actual physical data centers spread over many different locations. So I have different buildings, and then within those buildings, there are clusters of servers, and then there are racks with actually the various nodes that actually run a particular workload. So there's a whole bunch of capacity. And we can actually see, for example, in Azure, which is our focus, if we go and look, there's actually a nice little infrastructure global map. And here we can see all the different regions that are available to us. So here I can see there's lots, for example, in Europe, I can see there are regions available in South Africa, in United Arab Emirates, West India, China, Southeast Asia, there's ones in Australia, and then there's lots in the United States, there's ones in Canada. So there's all these different regions available to us. And just as I'm kind of drawing in that picture, those regions are made up of data centers within a certain perimeter area, built around a certain latency, but you think they're fairly close together. So there's this whole bunch of capacity in the cloud, and it offers, just like down here, services. Now, in the cloud, 
those services are very diverse. Yes, there's VMs, yes, there's containers, but there's databases, there's artificial intelligence, there's entire app services. There's just a huge amount of different functionality exposed to us. Now, a defining characteristic of all of this capacity is when we use it, we pay for what we use. I'm not pre-buying a, a rack of servers. I pay per second for, hey, some VM running. I pay for the amount of storage I used that month. So that capacity is what I pay for. And this cloud is multi-tenant by definition. Lots of different customers can use that cloud offering. That is isolation between the different customers. I don't want to be able to see someone else's data and I don't want them to see mine. But that segregation is done through software defined networking to separate the networks. There's a lot of security and encryption and hypervisor guards, all of these things to protect one thing from another. Now, if I think about we have this great cloud capacity with a huge number of services, one of the defining characteristics of that cloud com computing is well, how do I access it? And typically, that access is going to be over the internet. There are publicly accessible endpoints, i.e. things I can connect to, and I'm accessing that over the internet. Now, it doesn't have to only be the internet. Yes, that's the default mechanism I use to consume cloud services, but if I'm a large organization, I've got huge amounts of service running up in the cloud, and it, I think of it as an extension of my on-premises data centers, I really don't wanna go over the internet. So while yes, that definitely is an option, what you'll also see is for a lot of organizations, they have private connectivity. That private connectivity could be in the form of some kind of virtual private network, like a site to site connecting this site to a network construct in Azure. It could even be a private physical connection. You'll hear things like express route. So yes, by default, it's internet connected, but there's also this idea of private connectivity. Now, with this idea of the cloud, yes, we're used to the idea of a VM and a Kubernetes and containers. There really is just a huge range of services, but also the cadence of innovation. On premises, I don't want to keep upgrading my servers every couple of weeks. That, that would be a huge inconvenience. But in the cloud, because it's a managed offering, they are constantly innovating. They're constantly bringing new features. So I'm not waiting six months for some new feature. You really do get this cloud cadence. And because of this multi-tenant nature, it's just a huge range of types of service. Even something as basic as a virtual machine, there were virtual machines with GPUs, with local NVMe, NVMe storage, with um, RDMA network adapters with huge memory, with huge CPU, with huge IOPS and storage throughput. And you get all of these different options and I can pick and choose whatever I want. Now, why would I use this? Why would I use cloud computing? Firstly, think about just that huge amount of capacity. We can't even imagine the sheer scale that these cloud vendors operate and I'm obviously focusing here on people like Azure from Microsoft. There's this huge amount of capacity in all these different regions that I can just use on demand. I don't have to pre-say, hey, I wanna create 100 virtual machines. On demand, it's just always there. So at a minute's notice, I say click, 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 and it's gonna go and create my resource. And that offers up a huge amount of benefits. So let's think about for a second, if I'm using the cloud, some of the key benefits I'm gonna get, well, firstly, I get agility. Agility because on premises, I have to really think a long way in advance about what I'm going to use so I buy the right hardware, I rack it the right way, and then really I'm stuck with it. It has a certain lifespan for that piece of equipment I've purchased I need to make sure I get the most out of it. So I'm not very agile. I have to plan a long way ahead. 
and I have to keep using that for a really long time. I probably can't easily repurpose some physical thing. In the cloud, there's a huge range of services. I provision them on demand. If I wanna stop using it, I delete it. If I change my architecture, I go and create a new type of resource. Maybe I was running virtual machines and now I wanna to move to containers. I can do that. Now I wanna to move to an app service. I was running a database in a VM. Now I wanna to run to a managed database. Click, click, click. I can do it at any time. So I am super agile. As my architecture changes, my requirements changes, my needs change, I can at any point change what I want to do. And there's this huge number of regions. So if my customer base moves, if I have new customers, I can just stand things up in new regions. I don't have to have some, oh, well, I don't have a data center there. And because of that consumption, again, I just pay for what I'm using. So I have a huge amount of flexibility. Now, because I have these different physical buildings and all these different racks, it also helps me with high availability. I can absolutely think about, hey, I'm gonna have some instances running in this rack, some in this rack, some in this building, and some in this building. So I can have multiple instances of my service distributed over different physical buildings, different physical data centers with independent power and cooling and networking. We'll hear the term availability zones. That's talking about different physical buildings. You'll hear the term availability sets and fault domains. Well, they're different racks within a particular building. But I can leverage those for my high availability, depending on exactly what I need. Obviously, that builds into disaster recovery. Remember all those regions distributed all around the world, hundreds of miles apart, but still multiple regions in the same geopolitical boundary. So if I have data sovereignty requirements and not having to replicate my data to a different country, well, maybe I'm not allowed to do that. I need to keep it maybe in United States. I have to keep it in Europe. I have to keep it in Germany. Whatever that is, there are multiple regions within any geopolitical boundary, but they're hundreds of miles apart. So now by using that, I can asynchronously replicate, which means, hey, I'm not gonna impact the performance of my application, but I'm gonna send it to that other region as quickly as I can without impacting my performance. But I'm gonna have that disaster recovery capability. Now, maybe that's native to the service. It has its own disaster recovery. It's not like a virtual machine. There's capabilities with Azure Site Recovery to even replicate virtual machines between region. They're state on disk. Maybe I can even run Active Active. I can have instances running in multiple regions. I can think about scalability. So with scalability, that's a key tenant of the cloud. When we think about that consumption-based nature of the cloud, because I'm paying per second for the amount of resource that I have, I only wanna pay for what I actually need. So we have this idea of, yes, there's a huge amount of resource available. Yes, I can scale to this massive amount whenever I need it, but only when I need it. So if there is some huge peak workload, I know I'm not gonna hit, I'm not, oh, my server that I had on premise, oh, it's run out of disk space, or it's run out of memory, I'm stuck. That's not gonna happen. I have this near infinite concept of scale. And then leading into that, we get agility. Think about your workload coming in that you have to provide service for. If I can think about, well, I have time and I have the load on a system, is it completely flat? Probably isn't. More likely that load on my system has quiet times, it has busy times, it has maybe some average times, then it has another little peak time, then it's quiet again. And that has a certain seasonality. That could be over a certain hour. 
It could be a certain day. Maybe it's a domain controller and there's a log on batch of work. It could be weekly. Maybe it's a system for a pizza restaurant and it's Friday night and it's super busy Friday night. Rest time, it's not that busy. It could be monthly. I run some end of year batch. It could be annual. Maybe you're a tax software. Maybe it's every four years. I host the Olympics or I'm a country's election system. Wherever I have this variance, I want to be agile. I want to be able to change the amount of resource I'm offering. And when we think about change and reacting to that, you'll often hear about scaling. You'll hear about auto scaling. We'll hear about horizontal scaling. And that's really all about, hey, I have some units of work and what I actually want to do is change the number of instances I have of that unit based on how busy I am. Hey, I'm really busy, I need four instances. Hey, it's got quieter, now I just need two instances. Hey, it's at a medium time, I need three. So it's gonna horizontally scale out, adding more and scale in, removing them based on the amount of work that is actually happening. So you're gonna hear about auto scale, this idea of agility, that consumption-based nature is key to everything we're gonna do. So these are some key benefits we really get from the cloud.